We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 151 and this episode is all around compassion comp- I can't even say it compassion <laughs> fatigue in therapy with myself Jackie Jones and the wonderful Mr Bob Cook. <laughs> Thank you for that. I I was just thinking that I I uh I'm a bit tired. So and I think it's not compassion fatigue though, but of course being tired tired is one of the signs of compassion fatigue. So, but it isn't that. I'm just tired from other things I've been doing. Been very, very busy. Yeah, that'll do it all the time. That's one of the things we need to look after ourselves as therapists. Yeah, well, that, of course, if we don't do that, it does lead or can lead to what we can call compassion fatigue. Yeah. So a definition of compassion fatigue I looked up, I'll just read that to you. It's a term that describes the physical, emotional, and psychological impact of helping others, often through experience of stress or trauma. Yeah. Sometimes it's called vicarious trauma or secondary trauma, but basically it's a term that describes the physical, emotional, and psychological impact of helping other people, often through experience of stress or trauma. Yeah, it's it's an actual real thing, isn't it? I think people like, I don't know, sometimes they, they refer to these things in a lighthearted way, do you know what I mean? But it is actually a really important thing for us to be aware of as psychotherapists. Yeah, have you ever had it? I mean, have, have you? I think I have at times, yeah. But I've been aware of it. Hmm. Some people think about it in terms of burnout, but it's much more specific than burnout. Yeah. And much more intense than burnout. Burnout, yeah. of course, has very similar uh, traits that will appear to the condition. But when we're talking about compassion fatigue, we're talking about something I think which is more intense. And actually, I think the traits that um, occur from compassion fatigue that's quite a long time and certainly exhaust ourselves yeah absolutely i think rather than as a, a psychotherapist because i think i'm much more self aware now so i'm aware when i am tired or if there's something going on for me that i, I need to slow down a little bit but definitely when i was a foster carer and the children were with us 24/7 definitely was was had bouts of it then yeah so if you were to describe to somebody the bouts that you had, what were the sort of symptoms, do you think? Um, the, the physical symptoms were like headaches and um, I want to say irritable bowel, do you know what I mean? Ups, upset bowel and things like that. Um, wasn't sleeping very well. Difficulty in concentrating. I was irritable and short-tempered. Everything just seemed a bigger deal than what it needed to be. I think that was you know, something that I would normally deal with on a daily basis became all consuming and a a, a bigger issue. Mm, mm. Yeah. That's a that's a good way of describing it. I've jotted down some traits, if you like, or how you'll know that you've got it. Um and it's some of them the things you just said there fall into my descriptions. So I'll go through of them. Number one is what you've said, actually, feeling physical, psychologically, and emotionally exhausted. Yeah. Often, when you have this condition, you feel like you don't want to do anything. You feel quite, like, lethargic. And God forbid, but I know um, clients have reported this back, not necessarily to me, by the way, but certainly, I, th- I was thinking of a couple of clients, sorry, a couple of therapists who are supervised who talked about compassion fatigue and actually went off for a month yeah. to recover. 
And they, I said, how did you know they got it? And they said, they felt exhausted, um, felt irritable. They, and then they said, uh, and what really um, brought it home to me when one of my clients nudged me and said, you're falling asleep. Wow. <laughs> that is exhaustion. <laughs> yeah. And that really, it, it, it doesn't have to be an example of compassion fatigue, but linked in with a lot of other things. Yeah. I think one of the other things for me that I, I noticed was I felt disconnected from what was going on. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Like, do you mean like sort of like numbed? Um, yeah. Like where I'd normally be really sort of on the ball with it. I just couldn't be bothered. I, was, I wasn't I was really paying much attention to things, not as much as what I, I, would, I do normally. Yeah. Mm. So disconnected from what's going on around you in, in a sort of slight way. Yeah, it's kind of like I'd reached the level of overwhelm. There was no more room to be compassionate. It was just like, yeah, I've, I've shut the lid on it and there's just no room. So I was just disconnected from being empathic or, or I don't want to say caring, but yeah, just not paying as much attention. Okay, other symptoms then. Feeling helpless. Yep. Feeling powerless. Feeling irritable. Angry. Sad. Numb. That's why I use the word numb. Because yeah. that's Compton sim that's a very common symptom. Cut off would be another yeah. way to yeah. like said. Um <clears throat> often being a sense of being detached from people or feeling slightly away from what's going on. Yes, yeah. Or like an observer watching down on yourself in a way. So I think slightly detached, disconnected, things that you just talked about there. Um, ruminating about the suffering of other people and feeling angry towards the events of people causing the suffering. Blaming yourself and having thoughts of not having done enough to help the people who are suffering. A decreased sense of personal and professional com accomplishment, a change in your worldview of spirituality, physical symptoms including appetite and sleep disturbances, nausea and dizziness. And I'll add another one here onto my list, but I haven't got it down there. And that's um, a decrease in the ability to empathy. In other words, empathy goes down. I, I definitely noticed that, yeah. So all those things are a loss. Yes, yeah. And it's it's being aware of it. It, it. For me, it was quite subtle and it snuck up on me. Do you know what I mean? It's not something that happens overnight. It's like an ongoing thing. Um. Yeah. But that lack of empathy is, is a big one. It's like you're listening to it. And I can remember thinking, I should be bothered about this, but I'm not really bothered <laughs> yeah 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 so disconnected like yeah I just said. yeah uh, yeah and of course i think what you just said that's really important that you don't suddenly go from feeling okay to all these traits yeah or symptoms should we say um it, it's a build-up yes yeah and suddenly you've got four or five of the symptoms we just talked about yeah and then you suddenly don't feel like getting out of bed in the morning. Yeah. Or you don't feel like going to work. Absolutely. I'm thinking, oh, not that client again, or, you know, um, or I just don't feel like listening to another moment of this person's suffering or, or whatever it is. Yeah. <clears throat> because you feel you haven't got the capacity to actually do anything. Yeah, absolutely. And frustration at the whole situation, yeah. Mm, mm. And it's very common, what we're talking about here, to people in the helping professions. Yeah. Social workers, probation workers. Hospital staff, I would imagine over the COVID, over pandemic, there must have been an awful lot of NHS oh. frontline workers must have been oh. going through this horrendously, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Psychotherapists. Yeah. Um, 
certainly the example you've just said there would be a prime example of people went through, either nurses psychologists people went through the front line of working with covid yeah just get to a place where they had at least five six seven of these symptoms yeah 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 and I, th I think you know like like with the police and like you say you know probation services and social workers and things like that i think as a an industry if you want to call it that or as a profession i think they're very well aware of that and a lot of them do have support and and in-house counselors that they can go to because of that mm. Mm. which is really important mm. Mm. You know, it's, it's not seen as a vulnerability or as a flaw now. It's seen as, you know, a part of self-care to, to, you know, to notice these changes and to take care of yourself. Mm. Well, this is the key. And you talk about this a lot on many of the, lots of the podcasts, actually, you're often talking about taking care of yourself as a psychotherapist being really important. Absolutely. Top of the list. Because if we're not in a good place, we're no use to our, our clients at all. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So... Let's look at a, a list then of things therapists can do to take care of themselves, almost like a routine of good health. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll start it off. I mean, I, I think there's practical things and psychological things. Um, and perhaps we can just intersperse some practical things and other things. Um, but certainly, I think to start thinking about limiting the amount of clients you see in one day. Yeah. And the type of clients that you're seeing as well. Oh, you oh. know, that, that I, I can remember in our training, it was spoken about the 80 20 rule. Do you know what I mean? That 20% you know, of our clients need, you know, okay, we can take on difficult clients if there's such a thing but the other 20 percent maybe not <laughs> mm. and like you said i don't what, what what figure would you put on an okay amount of clients to see in a day let's just go back to what you just said about um see what you're differentiating with which i think is an interesting point and i don't like the terms i'm particularly going to use but i often hear these terms in books and bandied around, by the way, when people talk about easy and difficult clients. Yeah, I didn't want to say that, but basically no, that's, that's how it's... No, no, it's fine. I think yeah. lots of people do use those terms. Yeah. Um, and I think from that, you mean things like uh, difficult clients going into the sort of category of the more disturbed clients, people with personality disorders. Yeah. People which will uh drain or demand more energy from you yeah that's what i think you mean absolutely but people who perhaps yeah. have more stability or more sense of themselves or come with uh less traumatic or conflictual issues yeah won't drain you so much absolutely yeah. they won't want so much from you Yes, yeah, and we, we I, I may, I'm not even sure whether this is the right way of putting it, that maybe we don't need to be on guard as much with them, as in having personal boundaries and not stepping over those boundaries and being quite firm with the clients. You know, you need to have your eye on the ball with those clients a lot more, which is, yeah. is tiring if you're seeing a lot of those clients. Yeah, and I think that's an important point to think about in terms of how much energy um, these types of clients may drain you or yeah. demand from you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I haven't got a percentage on that. I, I understand what I said by 20%, 80%, percent that you don't, the, the, you just keep that balance more um, in your favour. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Mm. Now, the other bit we can go on to now, uh, which you just asked me then, in terms of how many clients you see a day. It's a very interesting one because what happens is that when people leave therapy school, if you like, which is like four years of training, they are so keen to start seeing clients 
and often so keen to start earning money because yeah. psychotherapy training is a very That's expensive so <laughs> yes. um but to try and get some money back they will take not always just about money but it's one of the things um they will take uh quite a lot more clients in a day that i think is good for them in what we're talking about here yeah yeah and it, it sort of appalls me so when i sometimes go over to oh when i ask these questions the therapist at my own institute or well-being center and they say eight or nine a day yeah. i think good gosh uh i usually say something i say and how come you want to see that many or what do you think the cost might be to yourself at a psychological level or even in terms of the build-up of energy yeah passes between two people uh, um or even have a discussion about what you might be carrying from one client to the other absolutely yeah if there isn't a gap in the middle a long enough gap yeah yeah i think one of the things for me that i was very well aware of like now i work from home this is where i see clients here so I can see, you know, sometimes I just have one client in a day. Sometimes I will see four or five clients in a day, but they're spread out. When I first qualified and I was hiring a room at the Institute, I just came over to Manchester for one day. Uh, so uh, I did have an yeah. awful lot of clients in that one day because that was the only time I had a room to see them in. So the practicalities of being a psychotherapist sometimes can mean that we don't always prioritise ourselves, which isn't very good. <laughs> no, uh, and often people quote financial things as well. Yeah. But in an ideal world, I would think, you know, especially if you've just started out, because I actually think the reverse of what people do, which is get lots of clients to pay back monies and this, that, and the other. And, of course, they suddenly go from having very few clients to having a lot of clients. Or might do, but I think more like four or five clients a day. So then the next question is, what do we mean by a day? Yeah. So some people might say, oh, that means ten o'clock in the morning to ten o'clock at night. Or some people might say, oh, that's ten to five. So I'll just say what I mean by a day. I think if I think a lot of people start about ten and go home about seven, or they might come in at three and go home at nine because they work in the evenings. But I think over a sort of seven hour period, yeah, four to five clients. Yeah, which gives you a, a break in between, like you said, so that you're not carrying one client over to another. And you, the, the other thing that I was really well aware of when I first qualified, and again, I was working at the Institute, was not eating and drinking enough during the day. You know, not making sure that I was looking after myself, you know, nutritionally if anything it was just eating snacks in between mm. and and not looking after myself so i'm not <laughs> going to be on top form hmm. so that's true so that goes to 20 to 25 clients a week yeah now clinical psychologists listening to this or even different types of therapists than long-term developmental psychotherapists oh might say oh gosh i see um 60 or 60 clients a week half an hour see clinical psychologists on their books will often see clients for just 20 minutes yeah and then they have to go so they may well have 60 people on their book that i think is far far too many by the way um, but that's not working in a deep way it's usually teaching them things like meditation mindfulness how to take care of themselves right you know so it's often at a different level yeah. than working at a deep therapeutic level with perhaps people who are quite disturbed. Yeah. So we have different levels as well. But I think for people like myself, yourself, I would stick to four or five a day if possible. Yeah. That means, you know, one hour, a client has an hour, then have a break, perhaps of half an hour or something like that time to walk around the block or clear your head or have a cup of tea or get ready for the next person absolutely make sure you have an hour's lunch yeah make sure you have breaks for tea 
all these things. Yeah. Yeah, I can remember driving home from, from you know, Manchester when I was working in Manchester and, and literally finding it so difficult to keep my eyes open. It, it was, you know, yeah, proper exhausting. Oh, oh. And maybe yeah. this, that, that, that story I told you at the beginning of the client that touched the therapist's legs because, you know, the therapist had nodded off. Yeah. Is unfortunately more common than you would think. Uh, it's or the shocking. therapist that yawns often aren't aware they're yawning. See that again, you know, it is it it's our responsibility to take care of ourselves outside the therapy room, you know, and to, to value the time that I, we, we're giving our clients. So, you know, making sure that we're getting enough sleep and, and things like that. You know, if we're out all night partying and then rocking up late, you know, to do a full day of work with clients when we're, we're not honoring the relationship enough. So it's important that, you know, we take responsibility for how we are as well. Mm. You know, it, it's not just all the psychological stuff. It's our physical health as well. I agree with you. I, that's that dim that's that dimension of what people talk when they talk about, you know, compassion fatigue. And I think there's another other dimensions. <clears throat> another one is if you haven't done your own therapy. Yeah. Uh, or you haven't done the healing that you need to do. You might be far more vulnerable and open to taking on the trauma uh, from the client to yourself. Yeah. Especially... Absolutely especially if it's in areas that you identify with yeah and then that starts then that trauma or vicarious trauma can often up and unconsciously be out of awareness builds up and builds up and leads to what we're talk, talking about here yeah. which is passion fatigue yeah and I, I i don't think we can avoid seeing clients that are gonna have been in similar situations than we have you know eventually we will meet that one client that we can associate with yeah absolutely oh i think far more common than just one i think you know if we're talking about depression talking about trauma talking about unmet needs talk about neglect loneliness abandonment all these sorts of things we may have touches of that in our history that we've yeah. never really talked about with other people yeah so we take it on board we merge with our clients and then suddenly our pressure cooker our own pressure cooker gets even more fuller yeah so we start feeling the feelings that our clients actually report to us in the therapy situation yeah and there is there's a definite skill to that in that separation of that's their feelings and and not mine. There's there's a definite skill to that. Yeah. First of all, I think you have to be aware of it. Yes. Or even if an, even at a normal level, if you sit down with somebody over a cup of tea in Costas or Nero's or somewhere exotic like that, um, and talk to them for I don't know, just talk for twenty minutes. Oh, not even that, fifteen minutes you'll often come away feeling bad yourself. Yeah. When you I work. I remember when once. In, down to 15 minutes. Yeah, in group process um, that we used to do at the end of our training weekends, all of a sudden I felt really, really anxious and I had no idea where it was coming from. I There was no reason for me to feel anxious, but, yeah, really strong. And it it was the person that was sitting next to me that suddenly started crying and said that they were feeling really anxious. And it was like, geez, this isn't even mine and I'm feeling it. And that, that was the first good. time I'd ever felt so strongly somebody else's emotions and feelings. Yeah. Very strange. Like up a danger of the so-called flavor of the month or a buzzword for therapists anyway, when they call themselves relational psychotherapists. Yeah. Now, 
I do not want to put down the term relational psychotherapist. I would call myself a relational psychotherapist, a developmental relational psychotherapist. But if you are going to work within the relationship with clients, you're far more likely to fall foul of compassion fatigue in the sense we're talking about here. Yeah. If you are in the game of things like CBT or like I said, with clinical psychologists, where it's much more mindfulness, it's much more uh, working in the adult, the adult techniques. Uh, doesn't necessarily have to be this in-depth relation to what we're talking about. You're much more likely to be protected from compassion fatigue. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? It's, it's really interesting. So, so you know, some of the things that we can do, I know that we've touched on about self-care, do you know what I mean? And not taking on too many clients during the day and making sure that we're as near 100% as we can be by how we look after ourselves outside of the therapy room. Um, knowing our professional boundaries as well, do you know what I mean? Within the therapy, I think that's really important. Sticking to the times that we start and the times that we finish and, and those sort of things. Um, supervision and peer support. And very, very, very important. Your own therapy, very, very important. Yeah, yeah. Um, Taking holidays. Absolutely, yeah, which can be a biggie for some clients. You know, the, the um, panic sets in when you say that you're going to be off for a week or two, yeah. Um, or, you, or, you be, or you will. Yes. You should really have a couple of days off, but you don't. You only have one day off. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That exactly makes sure that you are okay when you are recovering from an illness, and maybe you know continuous education, learning about this sort of stuff, so that you can take care of yourself. Yeah, there's many books written on this subject. Yeah. Because it's it's so common. Yeah. Well, um, it's part of the course, isn't it? If you're in the caring profession, I think we are empathic by nature. Well, here's the next dimension I wanted to talk about, if we've got time. And that is that a lot of people that come into the psychotherapy profession are often, are often or have been the most vulnerable people. Mm. Um, and that's why they're attracted to helping other people as a way of helping themselves. Yeah. So hopefully, in the training, they should have their own therapy which will help here. But often they're usually very sensitive, highly empathic people. Yes. And when you have when you're highly empathic and sensitive in these ways, you're far more likely to pick up the very vicarious trauma of clients. Yeah. Then all of a sudden you feel you can't be empathic anymore. That's the biggest clue, I think. Yeah. Of when you need to take some time off or watch this video, you know, watch this. If you're on YouTube, watch this or listen to the podcast and just think about and reflect on doing some things we're talking about here. Yeah. Absolutely. Because, you know, it's like you said, the majority <clears throat> of us go into this because we've been through our own issues we've either been to therapy ourselves and and you know we want to suddenly become it I, or even just be, being a people pleaser you know all my careers being a foster carer being a nursery nurse being a psychotherapist I'm very much a people pleaser so I do tend to or I did tend to take on other people's problems oh. that was just part of who I was oh. Oh. and often termed in the psychological trade as a rescuer yeah, absolutely. So it, it was a big thing for me to start to put boundaries in place when I was a psychotherapist. That that was, you know, that, yes, I can hear their issues and I can support them through things, but it's not my job to fix people. It's not my job to, to do anything. And that's a really, really important lesson that hopefully therapists learn in their training and then carry out when they start seeing clients. Yeah. Absolutely. It's it's a very steep learning curve. Absolutely. Yeah, who takes care of the cows? Yeah. Now there are enough books written on this, so it, 
you know, as you listen to these podcasts, if you if you have some identification of what we're talking about, I think to read or even just put it into Google so, or look at some of the articles on this subject uh, might be illuminating. Yeah. Well, another good podcast there, Bob. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, finally, one other thing about it. Often when you feel you have no, you're not enjoying yourself. Yes. Or there's a little joy in your life. It's often a symptom of what we're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, for me, I think the biggest thing that I noticed was the disconnect. And it, it was kind of like a flatlined, like you were saying, not having any joy, not not having any emotions of, of any description, really, apart from irritable. I did get quite irritable with people. You're right, because connection uh, is too much. Yeah. So disconnection, detachment Yeah. Um, is often one of the major symptoms we're all talking about here. Yeah. And I suppose the other side of it as well, and I'm not sure whether it's something that we see in the therapy room is the clients that have compassion fatigue that come in because they are maybe a carer of somebody or, you know, it's part of the job that they're doing. These are the things that they're going to be presenting within the therapy room as well. Yeah. And, and you said another truth, a true, you said a true thing is these types of clients and yourself, if we're suffering from, you know, compassion fatigue, have to, need to come to a place and start to accept that you can't fix everybody in the world and in fact really you can't fix anyone yeah absolutely. you can help people in terms of uh your therapeutic skills and hope to have an impact for them but actually in terms of fixing things for people it's only people who can fix them and often setting boundaries setting structures yeah. modeling what we're talking about here is the best thing we do for our clients yeah yeah and that sounds really strange i can remember you know the the first time that i realized that you know me prioritizing myself i'm practicing self-care whether that was you know postponing a, a session with somebody or whatever it was was modeling to them how we mm. take care of ourselves mm. Mm. And, yeah. and you know, having that discussion with somebody that, you know, I do take holidays, I will give you plenty of warning, but it's really important for me that I take some time away from therapy. Um, there's, you know, I'm not abandoning you or anything. It's about me prioritising myself mm. so that I'm the best version for you when I'm here. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't agree more. Right, thank you, Bob. So what we'll be talking about in the next session is inner child work. Gosh, I spent 40 years working with the inverted commas in the child. So that's been an interesting conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. So until next time, Bob, thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.